We're looking at reproductive decisions and women's well-being, of course, and the picture that I've got up there, if you can see it, is a group of young people, uh, young males and females. There is no such thing as just women's well-being because we are a society of males and females, and we interact with each other, and we have to have both males and females understanding the issues, relating to the issues, and becoming connected to life, as we would say within each other. So the picture is deliberately there of young people and of males and females because I think that's our place to start. Um, I deal with many various things. Uh, I've been with Birthright for 26 years uh, in Hamilton uh, and in that time have counseled, I can't tell you, probably more than a thousand women who have experienced uh, a pregnancy that they're not planning and all that goes with that. Uh, somewhere uh, in my very early stages of taking over as director, so uh, now, 21 years ago, I went to a conference and heard a speaker talking about Project Rachel. And Project Rachel is a ministry of healing for women who have had abortions. And I knew already, I'd only been with Birthright for five years, that we needed something like that in Hamilton. We had many women calling us who were suffering uh, and didn't know where to turn with that suffering, and so I wanted them to be able to seek assistance. Uh, tried to get several people to begin that ministry and had some difficulty. Uh, fast forward 15 years and won't go through all the details of what happened in that time, but I found myself uh, leaving a position of teaching that I loved and coming to work for the Diocese of Hamilton. And one of the first things on my plate as I began was to begin Project Rachel in the Diocese of Hamilton. So uh, sometimes things wait for us. That capacity has helped me to learn and confirm what I already knew about women and men and people who have been involved on a peripheral level about abortion. And so today I'm going to share uh, several things with you and we're going to go through it fairly quickly. Can't talk about this issue without first touching on human sexuality because we know that human sexuality is beautiful. It is intended to be as it is. It is life-giving both to people who uh, connect with each other and life-giving in terms of the, the sense that through our sexuality, we engage in intimate behavior and we produce life. And the last is that it encompasses all we are and all we do. And so that's the first starting point, that it is our humanness that is wonderful and celebrated. Uh, and unfortunately, sometimes this whole issue of women's reproductive health begins to move us away from the intent of human sexuality, that connectedness, the very physiology of who we are, that we cannot engage in intimate activities without it having an effect on us because hormones are put throughout our body and those things affect us, whether we want it to or not. Uh, only in the case uh, where we have a sexual relationship that is forced on us would we be able to move away from that uh, kind of understanding. And so we have to start with human sexuality being a beautiful thing in our lives, but one that carries with it great responsibility to ourselves because it affects us as who we are. And the other piece that we can't separate in this whole area is decision, decision making. Because whatever decision we make in our lives, no matter the age, it's important to us that we make a decision based on knowledge, time, understanding, all those things that make good decisions. It requires several steps. We're not here to talk about decision making, so I'm not gonna go into those steps, but it is important to understand that it takes several steps, and it can make a difference, of course, in a person's future. Uh, and we know that what we do at any age impacts us throughout our lifetime. And we are beginning to see that and sense that in terms of what we eat and exercise and all those kinds of things at an earlier age, but we still haven't quite understood the connection of the dots. And that is the issue that we have in the whole area of abortion for women. We have not allowed society, let alone the women and men who are part of this in a direct fashion, to understand the connection of the dots and that is what begins to give them issues. So first we have, if we're going to have an abortion, in most cases we have an unplanned pregnancy. There is, of course, the side of a planned pregnancy where the medical community uh, can intervene now in doing testing and says there's going to be issues with your baby. So we do have planned pregnancies, but still most abortions occur in unplanned pregnancies. Uh, and so what does an unplanned pregnancy do? Well, an unplanned pregnancy causes great fear. And the thing is, is that fear is not a good thing for us to be dealing with decision-making under. 
because in fear, it shuts down the thinking cortex of our brain, it exaggerates the emotional center of our brain, all of those kinds of things that don't make good decisions. And so, when we are afraid of something, uh, we end up having difficulty making decisions. Uh, and unplanned pregnancy, because of that, because of that fear, because the mind's not working, often leads people to see their situation of having a baby born as life ending as opposed to life altering. No one can deny having a baby is life altering. It absolutely is, whether planned or unplanned. And we need to be fair and honest about that. But it is not life ending. And many women believe that it will be. It's the psychology of what's happening to them. Uh, and you know, many times we make decisions based on fear that are not good. So why are women afraid? Well, they're feeling afraid of anyone finding out, especially their parents. If they're young and if they're older, there's their friends, their boss, still their parents. Uh, there's all kinds of people that we're afraid of. And my work at Birthright has allowed me to see that I would say 95% of the young people who come to me and the middle-aged people who come to me experiencing unplanned pregnancy are afraid of people finding out. And yet, in very few cases, in fact, I don't think we've ever had a case where someone has been killed, as they think they're going to be, uh, because of that. And I'm glad of that. I'm glad we haven't had anyone. We have had people angry and mad, and we have to be honest about that with them. We have to prepare them. And many of you work in this situation, so you understand uh, those kinds of things that you have to do. Most of them do not feel support from their partners, their friends, their parents, or others in their lives. Uh, I was just at a birthday party for a one-year-old little boy who was, uh, is a son of a friend of my daughter's. I got the call from my daughter on my cell phone. What are you doing tonight? It's always a bad call at 7.30 because I know she's not going to ask me to socialize with her. Uh, I said, what's up? She said, well, uh, her friend who has given me permission to share her story, her name is Kayla. Kayla is pregnant. I heard through the grapevine that she might be pregnant, but I haven't seen her. I just ran into her at Tim Hortons. She confirmed she is pregnant. I also heard that she was thinking of abortion, and she confirmed that too. And I told her she's already got the appointment. It's in about five days. Uh, I told her, before you go, please come and talk to my mom. So will you be home tonight? <laughs> Oh yeah, I wasn't really doing anything anyway. <laughs> so she came to the house, and the first word she said to me as she sat down, so I want you to know, Mrs. Hartnett, call me Teresa, I said, we're talking intimately here. I want you to know that I've been taking prenatal vitamins. I said, and you've just answered my question. You don't really want to have this abortion, do you? She said, no, but no one, zero people, have told me that I should. All of my friends, my boyfriend particularly, I haven't shared it with my parents yet. So the list went on. And that's the most important thing. She was going to have an abortion based on other people's desire. And when I hear the issue of abortion become one of choice, it angers me. Because it's not one of choice from my perspective for the majority of women that I see. In fact, I will say a little more later to this, but in all of my years, and as I say, not counted exactly, but I know it's more than a thousand uh, people that I've counseled, one, one has told me, I want an abortion, I would have an abortion, there's no other decision I'm gonna make. I would like to stand here and tell you that every other person I counseled has not had an abortion. I can tell you that's not true. Many have. So only one wanted it. That's not choice. Uh, and never will be, in the view of anyone. Most people, uh, young women in particular, are afraid that they feel that their future will be over. This is that sort of dying unto self sense. That whatever they had planned will not happen now. So they're making a decision that says, I have to sort of give up everything I ever wanted for this baby. That means dying to myself. Um, or I have to have an abortion so I can do those things. Uh, the truth is far from that, as we know. Uh, and we know that many young women can and do do very well having their, their baby, even if they choose to raise their baby, which most do in today's world, but they don't know that. And so when they think they have to choose between their life and their baby, they often make a decision for their own life. Makes sense, of course it makes sense. However, how many of you here are parents? 
then you'll know exactly what I'm going to say. Today, any moment, I would die for any one of my children. I hope I could say the same for my husband. I've only got this 90% surety. <laughs> I feel bad. It's a good job he's not here. He always gives, you know, I die for you, he says. But, and I love him tremendously. He's a tremendous support in my life. I don't know how I would live without him. But I, I'm not as deaf in this. <laughs> but with my children, there is not even a, a question. There is not even a question. And that's the truth. Angelina spoke so beautifully to it. That even when we don't choose to be a mother, we are a mother. When we don't choose to be a father, we are a father. I don't know it when I'm pregnant, especially if it's my first baby. I don't know it when I'm pregnant, and I am so afraid of how this is going to work that I stop thinking clearly. But some point in my future, I do know it, and I can't undo what I did, and I have to live with it. That's the reality of people choosing abortion. It is not about choice, yes, this is what I want, like the one. I'm, I venture to say that she probably did not have a lot of trouble. It's about all the ones who didn't want to, but had no way around it. Women are afraid of having the means to care for their children, of course, and when they know that there's means and places and people out there to help them, it can make all the difference in the world. It can prevent an abortion, of course. Uh, they're afraid of not having enough support in this world where we're transient and they may live where there's no support. They may culturally come from a background who is going to dismiss them if they have a baby and carry it to term. And we need to be able to offer support to them because again, if we really believe in choice, that's not a choice. The choice is what do you want to do and how do I make sure that you can do what you want to do. A choice is not having an abortion because my family will abandon me. And the other side of that coin is, and I've seen it so many times, that even in those cultural settings, many, many times, once the baby's born, the family does change and accept. It's the interim. I call us at Birthright the bridge to get from this fear to this place of baby born. And when we can get them through that, we can help them deal with their situations. And they're afraid of losing friends, family, boyfriend. The thing, if you're the pregnant woman, you can't get away from it. If you're the pregnant male, and I've heard them say it many times, you can say things like, how do I know it's my baby? <laughs> Devastating to a mother, but another response made out of fear. How do I get out of this? Oh well, there could be this little possibility. Even when they know it's probably not true. And so we have to help the males deal with that situation. So how can we help? people who are facing unplanned pregnancy. Well, uh, I work with Birthright, so we assist by offering free pregnancy tests, support and counseling, assistance at the time of the birth if they need that. So uh, I've gone through labor and delivery with many uh, young women and sometimes their boyfriends. Uh, also afterwards, immediately afterwards, uh, we can put them in touch with places that can provide them with the needs that they have. Sometimes we have some of those material goods that they need. So we keep that support up, uh, even after the baby's born. There are many of you here who work in other counseling centers and who work in uh, residential facilities that assist the young woman when they're pregnant. Those are all important things that make success, that bridge the gap from fear to life. Uh, and life, I don't mean that just for the baby. I mean life for the women who are experiencing this situation. Without it, they can suffer tremendous loss. So, is it necessary to help women who are in an unplanned pregnancy? And if you can see the picture and the lighting's not too good, so you may not be able to, there's three different kinds of, they're, they're ice cream cones actually, even though they look more like cupcakes. Uh, I was in a rush, <laughs> sorry. Uh, chocolate, a strawberry, and vanilla. I use this a lot when I'm in the classroom talking to young people because I say to them, I have a chocolate, strawberry, and vanilla ice cream. Which one would you like? Strawberry. She wants, sorry, you know what, did I say, I don't have strawberry, vanilla or chocolate? Uh, but, sorry, chocolate, chocolate. is the only. That's not a choice. When 999 people tell me I would not have this abortion but, that's not a choice. I have not given them what I said I would when I say that I want you to have choice. And I say that to anyone who is, whether they think abortion should be a choice or they think abortion should not be a choice, we have three choices when we're pregnant and women know it. I can abort, I can raise my child, or I can place my child for adoption. And we need to help educate them on all three. This is the biggest decision of their lives. 
This will affect them forever. They will not be able to get away from having been a mom and a dad. They can't get away from it. The decision about that is past. Now where do we go from here? And we have to make sure they understand clearly what's available to them because the after effects of choosing abortion, and abortion is the one thing that gets us out of it. I don't have to deal with it now. I don't have to tell my parents. I don't have to let any of my friends know. I don't even have to tell my boyfriend. Sounds pretty good. And the world, I don't know about you, but if I wasn't in this field studying it, I wouldn't know how difficult abortion was for women. I wouldn't hear them crying on the phone at Project Rachel. I wouldn't hear them crying on the phone at Birthright because they don't know where else to turn, so they call us even though they've already had an abortion. Because the world says it's the thing to do, as with Kayla. Now let me just briefly finish Kayla's story. So Kayla talks to me, I say you've got to talk to your mother, your, your mom and dad need to be part of this, we need you know, them to be on side with you and all those things. So she tells her mom, her mom is very supportive of her having the baby, she is now living at home with her mom raising her baby. But here's the thing, she was just not quite 21, she turned 21 before the baby was born, had a good pregnancy, everything went well, had the baby and the baby was born with Down syndrome. He is a beautiful little boy, although he doesn't like me too much, and I love babies. <laughs> he loves my daughter, and every time I look at him, he goes with a scowl at me. But he is a beautiful baby. She had him, and the day after she had him, she was in contact with the Down Syndrome Society. How am I best going to help my child? She has done everything in the first year that she can to help her child be as high functioning as he can, all those things. She never had a second where she thought, why didn't I have that abortion? But do you want me to tell you how many other people did? <laughs> this is the world we live in. And I told Kayla, Kayla, someday I'm gonna make you this per the person, not me. <laughs> I don't need to stand and tell your story. You're gonna be the person telling your story about the beautiful child that exists in this world because you chose life when everyone else wasn't even allowing you that option. And she's never looked back, and I think that's a real important part of her story, uh, because uh, if she had known, she would have had tremendous pressure from people on top of already just being a young mom. She would have had tremendous pressure. So, what are women feeling? Alone, pressured, unsure, and scared. Those are not things that you can deal with lightly in decision making. We need to help them feel cared for, not pressured when they come to us. We need to take time. This is not a decision you need to make today. We need to take some time to work through it. We need to look at all of the avenues. We need you to have all the information. And we need them to feel a little more sure and a little less scared that this is possible. That's the only way we can help them make the decision. And I, I need to share with you very briefly, I don't want to just stand up while I'm still, got my person at the back who's going to give me the nod on time. Uh, I want to share very briefly uh, this with you because um, one of the, the issues we have with women who come to see us is that they know that abortion is an option, of course, it's the only option for them. And if we don't take some time to tell them that they can take time, they're going to make a decision more quickly than they should. And they're living in a world, of course, who tells them that the, the decision to have an abortion is a smart one and a good one. Uh, and it's very difficult for them to rationalize that. But I need you to understand, and many of you who counsel will, I have had people call me personally, both at my office now and at home, because they know my involvement with Birthright and they don't want to call Birthright, who are what I would call um, diehard pro-life people. They've been on the walks. They've been on the marches. They know the facts of life of their children in the womb. They know all that we think they need and they still want to have an abortion because the world will judge them. If we're going to stop abortion, we got to stop judging. If a woman has four children and doesn't think she can raise a fifth and decides to place it for adoption, we need to be open to that or we're always going to have abortion. If a woman, for whatever reason, a couple, uh, doesn't feel capable of raising this third child, we need to be open to them placing for adoption. We need young people to understand that the gift of life in placing for adoption 
is valuable because their mind has two choices. I either raise the baby or I abort the baby. Adoption is not really an option for many. And we have some people here today, and I think they're going to be on the panel, I know they're going to be on the panel, who help young women with that decision uh, and young men with that decision to know that it is very much a positive option uh, for them. And so we also can't forget that in this whole area, uh, I'm not dealing with these issues today because they're all workshops on their own, but when we're involved in sexual activity, some of the speakers have spoken to it today, we have removed the connection between life if you're having sex, you might get pregnant. We need them to understand that connection. We need them to understand the risk of sexually transmitted diseases, so infections. Uh, we use both terms, same thing, of course. Uh, and we need the possible emotional, psychological issues to be touched on. This is aside from the abortion uh, issue, but I want to speak to it very, very briefly. There was a very large study down in the States, and I knew I should have written down the name but I didn't and now I'm forgetting it. They looked at 13,000 young people. They followed them through, 13 or 14 they began in the study and they followed them right through to their early 20s. The condition of being in the study was that they had to go through a series of tests that uh, showed that they were not in any way depressed. And the hypothesis of the study was that young people have a higher rate of depression than the rest of us and because of that, that's why they engage in the risky behaviors of alcohol and drugs and also why they engage in sex. Those three things all make us feel good. And so therefore, we couldn't blame our young people for being involved in those things. They're a little more depressed than we are. And so they followed them through in this study. And they found not what they were looking for, but something very different. They found that for those young people who did not engage in sexual activity, right through into their 20s when they stopped following them, they had the same rate of depression as the population, about 5 to 6 percent. There is depression, there's no denying that. For those that uh, engaged in sexual activity, depression showed up within the six months they came regularly for tests and to talk to someone. Depression showed up within six months of many of them of having a sexual encounter or within six months of having a sexual encounter and breaking up, which will make sense to all of you. And so what they found was that 64% of girls who had engaged in sexual activity and 34% of young men who had engaged in sexual activity were depressed in their adolescent years. Have you read the study? No, because I only heard it by chance at a conference the same reason you heard this morning that we don't read about the studies of the health risks of abortion and all those kinds of things. We are living in a world where the press tells us what they want us to hear, not what the news is, so we have to dig. But it's so important to know because our young people are going into these situations being affected by them and the long-term results on our society is not known. So we're looking at women's well-being and health, 64% of adolescents. We know that in the university setting, where it is a setting of sexual freedom, where we promote that from the day they walk onto campus, that we have a high rate of depression. There's other reasons. I'm not saying it's only sexual activity. But it's time for us to take hold of this and ask, what are we doing for young women and young men? What is the truth? Not what is it what we want to sell, but what is the truth? So then we move on to Project Rachel to see some truth. So what is the truth when people are experiencing or have experienced an abortion? Project Rachel is a ministry for men and women who have had a past abortion experience. Uh, for the most part, we get women calling us, but we have had some men call us, and we also have people who are connected either as grandparents to the child, uh, on a couple of occasions, someone who was a nurse or a doctor who has dealt in that situation and now are having a, a second uh, sort of thought about it all. So why do we need Project Rachel in the first place? Well. Studies show that most people, especially women, who experience an abortion will have some difficulty after abortion. My very first call on the Project Rachel line uh, was from a woman who had had an abortion 60 years ago. 60, 60, and she wanted not to die with this on her conscience. I have never stopped thinking about it, she said. That was one voice of many. We have had three days, three weeks, six months, most five years or beyond, and I'll get to that in a minute. But they all tell me the same thing. Please tell people abortion is not the solution that we think it's gonna be. 
I thought it was the end of my problem, it was only the beginning of a whole new set. We don't want that to be the case because we think we can have a solution, but it is the case and we have to be fair and honest to women about that. There's been a lot of research that says that probably 90% of women who have abortions will have some difficulties with it. Now that's not necessarily severe, but there's also about 10% uh, who will have severe problems of that 90%. So they will have need real care from a doctor, physician, they might be suicidal. Those are not the people that Project Rachel deals with. We deal with the 80% who are having either some mild difficulty or some major difficulty, but they're still functioning in their world and they don't need a, what I would call a psycho psychiatrist uh, intervention. And Project Rachel seeks to reach out to them and to assist them with their difficulties. So. Why do women choose abortion? Well, it's the reasons I went over already about unplanned pregnancy. I don't need to go over them again with you. I just wanted to list them again, all the feelings that they're having. But the last one I didn't talk about the first time because many women choose abortion in a planned pregnancy because of pressure by the medical community, because of their age. You're too old, you're too young, because of socioeconomic status, there's medical concerns, proven or not proven. In our world of testing, we can test, but we, we sometimes come up with things that we're not really sure what the issues will be. We just know there seems to be some abnormality, but we can't tell you what that will mean. If we tested all of us, we might be abnormal. <laughs> not saying anything about what I'm looking at, I'm just saying uh, that we might be. And so the reality in today's world is we're not sure of everything. And so there's a lot of pressure from the medical community. And things are said that are very difficult. Uh, if Kayla had gone and had some testing and they discovered that her child had Down syndrome, I know the things that more than likely would have been said to her. How are you going to deal with this child? Who is going to look after this child when you need to work? Who is going to look after this child when you die? I, well, you know, uh, suddenly we have no answers and so the answer must be abortion because it's an immediate solution. So that kind of pressure we need to be sure that we don't put on women. That's an unfair pressure. Uh, because now they're left thinking about things that we, they don't have an answer for because we don't have an answer for them. Uh, and all too often it causes a lot of difficulties. So why do women have difficulties after abortions? This is important to know because if we're going to help them beforehand we need to know how to prevent them from having difficulties uh, if they have an abortion. Uh, what is it that strikes at them? Well, most women have mixed feelings, I've told you that. They don't really want to have this abortion. They feel that they should but they don't really want to have it. Uh, many are directly violating their own moral code. How many people have you spoken to, even those that are what we would call pro-choice, will say, I would never have an abortion but I believe in choice. There's a lot of people who don't think abortion is a good thing, but when they're in, in a situation where they're fear and worry, they choose abortion against their own moral code and that comes back to haunt them. We have a conscience we can't get rid of, it's there for a reason. Many women feel they're forced by others and they feel anger and bitterness towards them, even those they've never told. They never told their husband or their boyfriend or their parents, but they are very angry with them because they think, if you would have supported me, if I knew, then I would not have gone through this. And that becomes a difficulty because they remove themselves. Many have limited disclosure about the abortion procedure. We had a little talk on disclosure not being necessary. Uh, that's the truth. And yet I beg to differ slightly, not differ that they don't disclose, but let me tell you that when my children, I have four, and uh, when they are having a tooth removed, I hear more than I care to <laughs> about what could happen and all those kinds of things. Uh, and yet with abortion, women are told generally nothing. A friend of mine was pregnant many years ago now, uh, before I had anything to do with Project Rachel. She was 27 years old, she was working in a job where she made nearly $60,000 a year, so well capable of looking after a child. She was uh, dating a man, they were engaged, and she became pregnant and he said, not ready to have a child yet, I want you to have an abortion, we'll get married, we'll have a child later. And she said, uh, you're not really the person I thought you were, and so they broke up. So when she went to the doctors for her next appointment, she shared that she was no longer with the person who was the father of the baby. That was the extent of the conversation and he did a check, did a couple of things and then he said to her, well I will have my, uh, my secretary call you, we'll make an appointment at a particular hospital in Hamilton that does abortions uh, and uh, he didn't say that, he just said make an appointment and she'll call you. 
And her mind began to whirl, she said. And any of you have ever been in a situation where someone's telling you bad news, uh, you will appreciate this. Uh, she said, oh, okay, you know, all right, I'll, I'll wait for the call. And she got up and he said, we'll see you, you know, in another month just to see that everything's okay. And she got to the door, couldn't take it anymore. She turned and she said to him, what do you think's wrong with my baby that you're making me an appointment? She thought she was going for some testing. And he said, well, nothing. I assumed you'd want an abortion. That's what's happening. That's what's happening. Talk about limited disclosure. She could have showed up. I mean, I think she would have asked questions. She was old enough, but she never went back to the doctor because of that. Uh, but the situations are out there. Late abortions cause particular difficulties because, of course, you felt the baby move and all those kinds of things. And I saw many people put up their hand being parents. And in particular, if you're mothers, uh, you know your children to a degree before they're born. And you actually can't wait to meet them because you have a sense of this one's impatient, <laughs> uh, this one's placid, you know, all those kinds of things. But late abortions means we've touched base with our children on a deeper level. But it also means that we have to have uh, abortions that we're more psychologically aware of. Not that we're not aware of the other, but th there's a different kind of abortion that occurs. And it seems to cause a lot more difficulties for people, although that's not to, to negate that early abortions cause difficulty. Issues related to wanted children later in life, you heard Angelina speak of losing her Joseph. Uh, that, that's very difficult. And many women have difficulty either getting pregnant or carrying a baby to term. Uh, and when they're not told, and we know medically that that's an issue now, and they're not told and they lose the second child, the, the wanted child, the guilt is heaped on far more because now they see two things having connected to their children. And so if they can't get pregnant or they lose a child, it's very difficult. Uh, and we're living in an environment where abortion uh, must be kept secret. Uh, and that's not, a, a lot of people say that society makes that happen. I'm not so sure about that. A uh, long, long time ago when I first started at Birthright, I went to give a talk about Birthright at a church, to a church group, and a priest came up to me afterwards and pulled me aside and said, Teresa, it should never surprise you that women would have difficulty after an abortion. I'm still having men come for reconciliation because they killed in the war. It was kill or be killed, and they've never gotten over that. And any of you who maybe had relatives who were older who were in any of the wars, they don't really talk about it. They say, I don't want to talk about it. I need to keep that. It's, it's so horrific to them that they can't share it. So abortion for women is so horrific, even if they're not really thinking about it. So there are a couple of stages of post-abortive women that I want to very briefly go over with you because I'm... I think it's important if you're going to be talking to women in any capacity where they may have had an abortion, we need to know how to assist them. So newly aborted women, this is a very first contact after an abortion. Uh, for us at Project Rachel, it's a phone contact. But for women who are newly aborted within the first three weeks, there are real physical things that we need to worry about. And those physical things, of course, are things like excess bleeding and that sort of thing that can happen to them because they have infections or there's a problem. And I like to share, I know we've had lunch and all those kinds of things, but <laughs> I like to share it because you may be in a position where you can help someone. You never know who's going to reach out to you. Heavy bleeding or cramping, they need to go to the ER, emergency room, and we need to tell them that. What is that? If they're bleeding through a pad in an hour, they need to go now. They need to go, maybe call an ambulance and go now. So that's a real concern if they're having that kind of heavy bleeding. If they're only having real heavy bleeding going through a pad every two to three hours, they probably don't need an ambulance, but they need to go to the ER and be seen to make sure that there's not an infection or some other problem, a piece of tissue, something left in them. So important because they could hemorrhage, they could die, uh, and that doesn't really uh, help them in any way, shape, or form. So it's important to ask them, are you bleeding heavily? Are you okay? Uh, many need the care that we would give to someone who's experienced the death of someone close to them because they have experienced the death of someone close to them. So when someone dies, we ask people, are you eating? Are you eating breakfast, lunch, and dinner? Even if you don't feel like it, please eat something. Are you sleeping? Most will have difficulty sleeping at night, so we encourage them, take a rest during the day when you can. So we're looking after their physical well-being. It's very important psychologically at this stage for women that we don't use baby language. So you lost a baby. 
because they probably can't deal with that yet and we may end up sending them into a point uh, where they may, if they're very, having a very difficult time, they may consider suicide, as you heard earlier. It's often a place we go to when we're not happy with ourselves, uh, and in this case, they're not happy. Uh, and it's important to ask them what they feel they are grieving, what is the issue, and that they can come up with their own where their surface is at. So if they've just had an abortion, we have to be very gentle and very cautious with them. Most important thing is to let her know that what she's feeling is normal. If I could tell you how many times I have had women call me, they've been to therapists, they've been to their doctors, they've been, and you heard it this already just before me, and they've told them, I think it's because of my abortion, and they say, no. If you take care of everything else, that won't be an issue. And they try to take care of everything else, but everything else never gets taken care of until they take care of this. And then they can have help taking care of these other things. So, so very important for us to do that. Uh, because when we normalize it, when we reach out to them, it says to them, you're important and I'm willing to walk through this journey with you. We can't change now their decision has been made. We can't help them look at all the pieces because they've already made a choice, but we can help them survive the choice that they've made. If they are having distance from abortion, whoops, sorry, uh, then there's lots of things that we need to help them with. So if it's three weeks or beyond, uh, then we have to help them know that there will be many symptoms which they will describe uh, and they may still be having some pain and these kinds of things. That's normal again uh, and that's okay. You have to tell them that's normal to be feeling those things. Um, it's important if they come to you because of an abortion that you ask them, is this your first pregnancy loss? Because in many cases it's not and they've buried the other one too. And unless we take care of a second abortion or a miscarriage, then we're not really going to be able to help them. So it's important to help them consider that possibility. Um, we can't assume that anyone's trauma is like anyone else's because every case I have talked to on the phone and we refer them for professional counseling is different. Their story is different. Their background is different. Their reasons were different. Their fears were different. It was fear, but it was a different reason that led them that way. Many have been in denial for many, many years and that's what's kept them safe. So moving out of denial is very hard. I had a woman once call me who said, I know, I know I had an abortion. I know that factually. It's just that part of me feels maybe it was just a dream. I just haven't quite been able to grasp it as real. And so for me to push her out of that would be very difficult psychologically for her. We have to help them along that little path until they can accept it themselves, as Angelina said earlier. And many times they've isolated themselves from anyone and everyone who will remind them of an abortion. They've moved away from family. They've moved away from friends. They no longer see the father of the baby. Actually, that's a very common thing that that doesn't last whether they're married or not. And so she doesn't have those supports. So we have to be that support and put her in touch with people who can be a support to her because alone, it's hard to grieve anything. Grief requires support. Even though it's a personal journey, it requires support around us to help with that. So what is the aftermath of abortion? Well, experts uh, believe that uh, most people that are involved in an abortion will experience all the symptoms of grief. Uh, and so they need to grieve the child, as Angelina shared with you. Until they grieve their child, it's going to stay there in the background. And like any grief, grief is kind of tricky, you know. It stays back here like this, just waiting. We live our lives, we think we're fine, and then it waits for the moment when we least want it to, and it says, now I'm here, I was just waiting in the background. Did you think I was gone? And that's what can happen here. So. Um, many studies have found uh, those that experience abortion, of course, look to various ways to block that pain. They're going to drink, use drugs, promiscuous behavior, all the things you heard about already, uh, in order to stop the pain. Anything that will give me a relief, makes me think, not think about it, is what I'm going to engage in, and I'm going to tell myself that's what I want to do. I'm not going to tell myself it's because I've had an abortion, I'm going to tell myself it's what I want to do. So I'm going to try to remove myself from me. Uh, this, I don't know if you can see the picture because the lighting's not too good, but she's looking in the mirror and I'm going to try not to do that. I'm going to live my life without looking in the mirror because it's easier for me to survive. 
There's four defense mechanisms that go into place for people who have had abortions in order to try to stop themselves from having to deal with it. Sometimes they're using more than one, sometimes they're gearing in one. The first one is what we call rationalization, or refining ways to make it okay. So of course, my parents wouldn't support me, my boyfriend wouldn't support me, I couldn't afford the baby, I needed to finish school. I've got every reason why I had to have the abortion, and for a little while, I'm okay with that. In fact, right afterwards, when I counsel women, I tell them, many people right after abortion feel a sense of relief. They do. It's done, it's all I don't have to think about it. Many people who have a child in place for adoption feel pain. Uh, there's no, I don't want to be unrealistic about that when I'm talking to a woman who's pregnant. But I do want to tell her that what I know from experience of other women, what other women have told me and shared with me, is that the journey from relief is one that moves into pain and one pain that never really goes away. We can learn to live with it, but it's never gone. Just like any other person we lose, we grieve them forever. We're changed because they're gone. Uh, and the difference here with adoption is that that pain of separation moves into one of joy. They're having a birthday. They're starting school. They would be graduating. So while it's difficult, there's a different journey that people work through in those two things. The second defense mechanism they put up is repression. They block out memories of the emotional pain associated with the event. So as the woman who said, I know that I had an abortion, I just can't remember anything of the details, I'm just going to block it out. This happens with many people, with abuse, with death, with things that we can't deal with, we just block it out. And we're not going to think about it, as long as we don't think about it, we think we're okay. Uh, but it's not gone, it's just being repressed and it's deep down. The third is a compensation, and this is uh, fairly normal actually. They make up for the adoption, or through the abortion, by doing good things. They become involved in the pro-life movement. They become involved in charities. They become involved in their church. They become involved in the community. They're gonna do good things to prove that, that I'm a good person, even though I did this bad thing. And many times, my own birthright volunteers have shared with me at the end of their training that one of the reasons I want to be here is because I've had an abortion in the past. And everybody thinks I'm a good person, but I'm not. How sad, because they are a good person, but they can't see themselves in that light because of the abortion. And so they try to make up for it, and then many will try to make up for it by having another child. So they will deliberately get pregnant again and try to make up for it. The problem with that is it doesn't work. It doesn't work because the most logical time, most likely, sorry, not logical, the most likely time that someone's gonna have difficulty with an abortion is when their child that they choose to have is born. Uh, because now we're gonna look at the pictures, we're gonna wanna know about the development. And let me tell you, my life has been forever changed because of the birth of my first child and I never had an abortion. On the day he was born, I was 25 years old and I wanted to have a baby since I was 12 years old. I was really anxious to be a mother. I was married for four years. I was in a great relationship. So everything in my life was good. And they came with this baby. They took him off to bath him up and he was born on Father's Day at 6.30 in the morning. So my husband had gone home to have a quick shower. Before he got back, they brought the baby back all cleaned up and looking better than he did initially. They placed him in my arms, and I looked at this prejudicially beautiful child, <laughs> and the first thought that went through my head was, this is what we're talking about when we talk about abortion. I had never been involved in any way, shape, or form in anything to do with pro-life or helping women with abortion or anything, nothing. Don't ask me why that thought went through my head. For three days, I couldn't get it out of my head. The three days that I was in the hospital, really it's like a bit of one day and <laughs> one day and a bit of another day. It was that powerful that I joined Birthright because I knew I wanted to help women because this is what we were talking about. And I have for 25, 26 years been with Birthright I have become involved with Project Rachel. It has defined my life in many ways. That moment, and I had not had anything in the background that was hurting me. So you can imagine women who have been trying to repress, who have been trying to rationalize, now having a baby who they love placed in their arms and thinking about the one who they didn't have placed in their arms. 
One time at Birthright, a man came in to fix my photocopier. I showed him the photocopier, he did his job. At the end, he said, can I just see you for a minute? And I thought he was gonna tell me some major problem with the photocopier. He had fixed it, no problem with your photocopier. He said, but can I ask you what you do here? So I explained, you know, we help support women, we do pregnancy tests, we talk to them about uh, what their needs are and all those kinds of things. And he said, can I talk to you for a minute? So I took him into the little room and we sat down and I said, yes, can I, can I help you with something? He was about 35, I'm gonna say. He said, when I was 19 years old, I was in first year university and my girlfriend got pregnant and I was going to support her. So I went with her to the uh, doctor. They had a medical sort of center or unit that the kids could go to. They did a pregnancy test and she was pregnant. And the person sitting across from us said, you're both 19, you're in first year of university. Of course you'll want to have an abortion. And he said, we both just sat there looking at this person. They were telling us it must be true. And we sort of shook our heads and she said, I'll make the appointment for you and we will give you a call. And he said, I, we never talked about it. <clears throat> Neither of us, he said, this was just the moment. Then on the day, I knew the day and time, and we went together, we still didn't talk about it. She had the abortion, we still didn't talk about it. Eventually, we broke up. I went out with other people, I met my wife, I'm married, I have three beautiful children, and from the day my first child was born, I haven't been able to get out of my head that I didn't protect my first child. We're not immune to it. We want to be, because it would be an easy solution, but we're not immune. So we compensate and we try to get over things. And the last one is this sort of reaction formation. We push down the feelings that we're really having and we allow sort of the opposite feelings to sort of come to the surface. We might become an abortion advocate because if I can say and believe that abortion is right, then I don't have to deal with the pain of what I've had in my life. Uh, and this can consume a lot of time and mental energy and so uh, we go through this not having to deal with our own feelings. And then when stress comes into a person's life, the feelings surface and can cause difficulty. So something happens and it can be something good or it can be something bad. In many cases when they call us at Project Rachel, someone in their life has died uh, and so the, it, it sort of doesn't allow them to repress all of this anymore and it comes bubbling up. Sometimes it's something good, the birth of a child, the getting married, there's all kinds of things that raises it to the surface. But whatever happens, they can no longer deny what's eating them inside, even though they're not aware of it, uh, as Angelina said, in the subconscious. It's still there, even though we're not thinking about it. And that's when they need to reach out often for some assistance, because they can no longer thrive in their environment. And yet they've told no one. I would say that 90% of the people who call us say, you're the first person I'm voicing this to. In fact, Many of the calls I get are, Project Rachel, Teresa speaking, can I help you? Click. Or, same thing, but you hear a baby crying in the background. And I know, they've had a child and they're now having difficulty. Or, simply crying. Crying, 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 and then, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And I say, you take your time now, as much as you need, and I'm just gonna stay on the other end of this phone with you. And eventually they cry it out. It can take a long time, and then they begin to speak. And our method is to refer them to counselors, but sometimes they're not ready to do that because I'm safe on the phone. I'm safe on the phone with them. So, how does Project Rachel help? Well, it's a ministry of reconciliation and healing, and so it uh, tries to engage people who have been affected by the loss of a child. Um, and it makes sure that they are put in touch with um, someone who can help them through their grief. We have trained counselors. Anyone who is with us in Project Rachel had to be a counselor trained first. Uh, we have taken them through Project Rachel training uh, and um, we have uh, made sure that uh, they can feel a sense of relief from what they have had happen in their life by going through a process of grief. And Angelina mentioned some of them to you today. It is telling the story which can take the longest amount of time because they leave entire parts out. 
And as a person speaking to them, you know there was something between A and B, but they haven't quite put the dots together. And then eventually we name the baby and all those kinds of things that help them with the grief. And someone asked the question, how do you deal with someone who you know has had abortion and you know it's affecting them, but you know they're not quite ready to? The best you can do is gently introduce them by saying things like, you know, I was at a conference today and they talked about the difficulty that some people have with abortion and, and that you can reach out through places like Project Rachel. Because if you put it on them directly, they're going to reject it. So we need to gently introduce that there is support and help out there. Uh, and that's very important. Uh, and for, for women who are feeling pain, they need to walk through it. Someone asked the question, what about people who don't have any Christian or I'll say faith beliefs? Well, here's an interesting thing. There's been a lot of research that says even people who can believe, would identify themselves as atheists somehow need to turn their child over to a higher being. They might not identify it with, as God, but to a higher being in order to feel that their child is being cared for. And part of the Project Rachel process is reconciling with who is it that you're turning your child over to, to care for and look after now, and that helps with the healing. And then they have to go through reconciliation of self and then others, whether the others knew or not. And some tell their story then to the people in their lives and some never tell. They keep it a secret, but they've healed and they're able to develop those relationships. And some need to reconcile with God. The interesting thing is, is that the reason Project Rachel exists is because people were going for reconciliation in the Catholic Church down in Milwaukee and the priests were giving them reconciliation and then they came back. And they give reconciliation and they came back. And they give them, and so then they went to the bishop and they said, uh, something's not working here. We're doing our best, but it's not, they, they don't feel reconciled. And so out of that was born Project Rachel. How do we help women and men pass this? Because we know that God forgives those who truly ask for forgiveness, but we need to forgive ourselves in that process because it's going to keep affecting us uh, if it doesn't. So again, I've already talked to you about those things. Um, what we really want people to know who have had an abortion, that they're not alone. They made a decision, that decision is affecting them, and now people are going to reach out to help them. And I believe when women and men who have had abortions can heal from those abortions, not only will their lives be better, but they will be your best advocates for helping people understand about their decision because the decision they're going to make when they have an unplanned pregnancy is going to affect who they are forever. There's no question about it. Now, I think we probably only have about five minutes. So I was going to give you a little case to chat about at your tables. But I will give you the case just to let you understand there's many. Uh, OK, so she says that's fine. You can have a couple of minutes to talk about it. I'm going to give you the case. And I'm going to ask you to think about, would this woman have made a decision to have an abortion, and if she didn't make a decision to have an abortion, what supports would she need in order to get her through? So here's the real case scenario. Call her Maria. Maria came to me. Uh, she had two children that were uh, fairly young, five and seven, and she and her husband had temporarily separated because they were having some difficulties, had a big fight, and he left to go stay at his parents' house. They were apart for about two weeks. In the middle of those two weeks, Maria went out with some friends, had a little too much to drink, and went home with some guy she met at the bar, didn't even really know his last name, only knew where she was when she woke up. On the second week, her husband came back and said, this is crazy, I love you, we've got these children, we've got to work this out, and they both decided to reconcile. And they decided they would get counseling and all of that. About a week later, she realized that she did not have her period, but she put it down to stress. This is a stressful time, we've been separated, all that. A week after that, when she still had no period, she decided she would do a home pregnancy test. The home pregnancy test was positive. Now here's the little issue. Her husband had had a vasectomy, so there was no sort of fooling that this might have been his child. And so she was devastated. We were going to reconcile. She loved her children and she wanted them to have their parents together. And now she was pregnant and what would she do? So take a couple of minutes just to chat about 
what do you think she did and what were the things that would have affected her decision? And then if you think that she did make a decision to carry her child, what maybe were some of the supports we would need to offer her? So go ahead and chat a little. How many of you believe that she would have made a choice for abortion? Just a few. So the rest of you decided that she would carry her baby to term. What happened in the end, because you want to know the end of the story, is that when she told her husband, well, you can imagine. When I tell this story, most men will say he never could have accepted the child. That's their immediate response. I'm not saying their ultimate response. That's their first response. Uh, but her husband did accept the child, and he raised the child as his own. Uh, she was, they went for counseling, they got, which we strongly recommended, that they needed counseling because they already had some issues, and this was going to be another point on it. But by the time the baby was born, they were in pretty good shape, and they continued with some counseling afterwards, uh, and all worked out. But it was just as likely that her fear would have driven her to say he'll leave, and it was just as likely that he would leave. So that's the reality, and I, I gave you that case, I could give you others. This is not black and white. This is about people's pain, people's worry, people's lives being, they think, destroyed, and not understanding that from this moment on, your life will be something different. So you need to decide what is the best route you can take now, and we have to help them do that. I believe we have hope. I believe that people are beginning to understand the importance of knowing that life exists, knowing that abortion affects women and men, and knowing that as a society we've got to start looking at what do we want to say we are and what do we stand for. Uh, but irregardless of it all, no matter if abortion becomes illegal in Canada or any of those things, people will always need us to take their hand and walk them across as a bridge. If we're not there for them, we'll never stop abortion. So keep doing whatever you do to support women and men because with us and with others, we can change the world whether the law changes or not. Thank you very much for being here.